Salutations. And welcome to Gilded Goss, the podcast for all the weird and wild happenings of the Gilded Age. I'm Diana Palmer. And I'm Ward McAllister, your governor of Fovina, the hand when you <laughs> don't know where to stand at a party. I'm going to be there for you when you need me to, that also rhymed. <laughs> and Ward McAllister over here is brought to you by Justin Palmer. <laughs> if Justin Palmer is that handsome gentleman outside, then I am flattered that you might have thought I was him. But mm. the truth about it is I'm here to, to bring you up, to take you to the places you want to go in society. I'm going to show you how to get into those clubs you've been wanting to get into so bad. Uh, well, thanks, Ward. It's, you know, nice to meet you. Pleasure to have you. Of course it is. <laughs> but I, I kind of need my co-host. All right. Okay. Well, I, I'll bring him in here. Just give me a second now. Oh, my God, Diana. <laughs> A, a small mustachioed man just ran past me uh, on my way in here. Did he smell like starlight and tinctures? He smelled like uh, tobacco, like pipe tobacco and mint, mostly. Oh. Yeah, the two go together. Man, how lucky are we that the star of today's episode would plop through the veil of time and space and grace us with his presence. <laughs> well, he must have heard us calling to him for his very specific and, and powerful expertise. Yeah, we did. I guess we summoned him. We do burn a lot of different <laughs> kinds of incense in this room. There's sage. There's uh, Nag Champa. And when you have those things, you just might get a spirit in the room. And old sneakers. Yeah, old sneakers, too. Because <laughs> we're in our closet. Today we're talking about the eccentric pal of Mrs. Astor, Mr. Ward McAllister. They were bosom buddies back in the Gilded Age. So he was like uh, Robin to her Batman? Yeah. Like Patrick to her SpongeBob? Uh-huh. Mostly like Samwise Gamgee to her Frodo. <laughs> yep, yep. Ward McAllister was the mustachioed arbiter of class among the wealthy elite of the Gilded Age. He had influence, he had a Benoit Blanc accent, and most importantly, he had the ear of Mrs. Astor. He literally had her ear. <laughs> he took it away from her. Everyone was like, where'd your ear go? That's why they were so close. It was an embarrassing story. And Nathan Lane played him with just the right amount of genteel flair and smarm on the Gilded Age HBO series. Huge Nathan Lane stan. Uh, Birdcage is a fantastic movie. He's a wonderful actor. Yeah, he was my he was my birdcage mummy in the nineties. <laughs> Socialite Elizabeth Lair called him the Shepherd of the Four Hundred, and old money scion Stuyvesant Fish called him a demagogue. Now I, I do take issue with being called a demagogue <laughs> by a fish. All right, that that is a problem for me. Although a demagogue does have power, and I do love having power. <laughs> so how did this short and pudgy ally of Mrs. Astor find himself? Kicked out of high society and called a mouse-colored ass. <laughs> what warranted such ire? Mouse-colored ass is such a, it's such a specific type of insult from the time. Yeah, they were, journalists were very good at burns back then. So, let's find out what happened with good old Ward. The sources for our episode are Wikipedia, the Slate article The 19th Century Hustler, who inspired Nathan Lane's character on The Gilded Age, written by Rebecca Onion, and the New York Times article, all the way from 1896, titled Flatbush Has a Ghost, author unknown. And the rest will be listed in our show notes. I'm very excited to talk about a Flatbush ghost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Samuel Ward McAllister was born into a prominent Southern family in Savannah, Georgia, on December 28, 1927. And now. It's time for Corrections Corner. Warren McAllister was actually born in 1827. And now, back to the story. And that's where it all went wrong. He was the, like, ultimate middle child between Christmas and New Year's. Now, some might say that three days after Christmas, three days before the New Year, Betwixt is a vortex that turns you into some kind of attention-seeking monster, but I would say that it turns you into a, a, a gentleman of class and dignity, someone who other people want to listen to. 
He grew up in Savannah, but his family spent summers in the very posh Newport, Rhode Island. And that gave him a taste of the high life. And he would go on to chase that for his whole life. Mm -hmm. His fascination with the elite led him to move in with a wealthy relative in New York when he was just a young man. And he was hoping to inherit her money. But as fate would have it, she only left him like just a thousand dollars in her will. A thousand dollars for the time, though. Still a lot of money. What do you think? He purchased one thing with his whole inheritance. So what do you think he purchased? He purchased a um, a Ferrari. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, there weren't cars yet. So a Ferrari horse. Yes. It was a horse named Ferrari. <laughs> it was a designer horse with an Italian accent and it was faster than all the other horses. <laughs> I mean, I wish, but he he bought just one very expertly tailored eccentric suit. And he had the goal of convincing his peers that he was among them and he was wealthy and deserving of their time and attention. I bet it worked. I mean, it probably worked. <laughs> Not yet. In 1850, he went out west and worked as a lawyer in San Francisco during the gold rush, which is a great time to be there. And this is when he and his dad struck it rich with their mining law firm, McAllister & Sons. At McAllister & Sons, we will litigate over your gold <laughs> any time you need us to. Your gold is not old. Your gold is for me and my, I mean, your gold is for you. <laughs> and don't, don't get into, do get into a fight with the company you work for. I will fight for you. <laughs> Call 1-888-GOLD-NOW for McAllister & Sons. Your gold is my gold. <laughs> he retired from law and devoted himself solely to his social life after that. It's a trajectory that I think makes sense. That's what I'm waiting for. Yeah, just devoting yourself entirely to your social life? Yeah, yeah. Then Ward headed back east and found himself an heiress to marry. Well, what I like to do is I search for real gold in the west, and then I search <laughs> for someone else's gold in the east. <laughs> That's right. He married um, Sarah Tainter Gibbons in 1853, and, you know, unlike Ward, she was an introvert which I found interesting. She preferred to stay home while Ward was out entertaining. and I hope that they complimented one another. And I, I hope it wasn't so much, darling, I need you to stay home now because I got to go to a cigar club to entertain about 15 people. <laughs> and they would go on to have three kids. So shortly after marrying, he and his wife bought a farm in Rhode Island, which sounds dreamy. Yeah, let's buy a farm in Rhode Island, but... please. And then they set off traipsing across Europe for three years. Let's, That's... Also, let's do that, too. Yeah, I mean, cool vacation. Three years. Nice. And this is when he absorbed every aspect of elite society. And the t titled nobility were his teachers. The secret of this moment is that he actually physically absorbed his teachers. <laughs> the people that he met, he would go there and he would, he would suck them into his body. They would become <laughs> part of him. And um, that's why he's also a cryptid. And that's, that's how you learn, and that's also why there's a teacher shortage <laughs> in America right now. <laughs> he, he learned the ins and outs of fine wine, haute cuisine, and the etiquette of balls and formal gatherings. And he sharpened his skills of the arts and charming others. He returned to America as the self-appointed authority in how to be, quote, the right kind of rich. Now that I have returned to America, I will stand on my soapbox and I will tell the world... I am the self-appointed authority on how to be the right kind of rich, which of course means I know the other side, and I will tell you when you are the wrong kind of rich, which is anything that I say not to do. <laughs> Described as a pompous and stubborn little weirdo, <laughs> which, who among us, right? Ward utilized his wife's wealth and his social connections to become the chief party planner and tastemaker of New York's upper class. Our actual personal opinions of this man aside, <laughs> we didn't describe him as a pompous and stubborn little weirdo, but he seems to be one. If you needed to throw a lavish party with the most exquisite cuisine and guests to match, he was your man. And if you recall from our first episode, he helped Mrs. Astor craft that list of the best and most respectable members of the upper class, the 400. And it took him a few years to, to craft. The list was some kind, sometimes called McAllister's 400, and it was so exclusive that big names like John D. Rockefeller and J.B.P. Morgan were not included. It's really, hard to, it's really hard to imagine a list where John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan are not on it. Yeah, that's weird. And, you know, however dubious 
the claims may have been, the papers loved reporting on all the hurt feelings of those who were excluded. <laughs> oh, man, I would love to see those. On March 24th, 1888, of the 400, Ward told the New York Tribune that, There are only about 400 people in fashionable New York society. If you go outside that number, you strike people who are not at ease in a ballroom or make other people not at ease, who have not the poise, the aptitude for polite conversation, the polished and deferential manner, the infinite capacity of good humor and ability to entertain or be entertained that society demands. <laughs> Thanks to the Industrial Revolution, there were some new rich kids on the scene, and they wanted in. They wanted to join the ranks of the old moneyed in society. Of course. The newly rich believed their wealth alone entitled them to gain entry into these exclusive clubs and social functions, all the they, hall parties. They worked so hard to get in. Or, I mean, at least it appears that way based on the, the HBO show. <laughs> and, you know, after some pushback, which we see... It's a major plot point of the HBO show. Eventually, some of the old guard felt change was inevitable, and someone had to train the new guys. All right, we gotta let these people in. Let's <laughs> just go ahead and do it. <laughs> Enter Ward McAllister. He was, quote, the guardian of the veil between the wealthy elite and the merely wealthy. Guardian of the veil, meaning he was a fairy prince. Mm -hmm. he, he was. Yeah, he literally guarded a veil of magic between mm -hmm. these people. If he deemed them worthy, he acted as a guide to new money families and ushering them into high society. To be deemed worthy, mm -hmm. you take a copper bowl, you put into it some sugar, some salt, a little bit of cinnamon and cumin, you add some milk, crush that up, and leave it on your nightstand for a week and a half. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Part of his motivation was he wanted to create a shared identity among New York's wealthy families. A sort of self-sustained aristocracy. Mm -hmm. He wanted to copy the Europeans. Yeah. With the support of Mrs. Astor, he founded the Society of Patriarchs in 1872. The Society of Patriarchs. Indeed. It was a club of 25, quote, representative men of worth, respectability, and responsibility. They called themselves the Patriarchs. And the club would later expand to 50 men. It would later expand to 100 men. <laughs> A thousand men. Ten thousand men. A million men. A million men. The goal of the Society of Patriarchs was to unite the old guard with the newbies. And they achieved this by throwing the most exquisite balls. This is a, um, a note from the people doing the podcast. It didn't really expand to a million men. <laughs> we just want to make that clear. These balls were also called marriage marts. And people like Mrs. Astor used them to find suitable well-moneyed, respectable husbands for their daughters. It's like supermarket sweep for a husband. Yeah. We're so excited to have you here today, and today you're going to be running down the aisles trying to pick up the man who's going to better your life the most. <laughs> Only 25 in invitations would be sent out to carefully select a gentleman, and these men were in turn asked to invite nine additional guests. They would invite... Mm -hmm. Four debutantes and five eligible bachelors, yes. which is, I guess, a good ratio for matchmaking. That's 225 people, and <laughs> this is called mental math. <laughs> that may or may not be correct. We think it's correct. <laughs> Send us a correction if yeah. not. Email us. <laughs> Email us at gildedgoss at gmail.com <laughs> to tell us whether or not my mental math was correct and anything else you might want to tell us. And <laughs> these balls would start at midnight. As guests filled the ballroom of the popular restaurant Del Monaco's, and guests would dance to a live orchestra. Sounds dreamy. Don't worry, my dear. I'll take you to Del Monaco's, and we'll, <laughs> we'll dance the night away. The nine-course dinner would start at 1.30 in the morning, followed by a night of dancing and drinking and merriment and matchmaking until dawn. I'm 100% down uh, for this party. However... Starting a nine-course dinner at one thirty in the morning. That's a lot. Okay? No, just give me some tacos and... Oh, yes. You know, call it a night. Yes. Invitations to these balls were hard to come by, and that made them the event of the social year. 
This bolstered Ward's influence, and soon he dominated the management committees of most of the society vaults. He popped up everywhere like a little mustachioed weasel. Now, I have had people tell me that I do resemble a weasel <laughs> in my activity here, but I will tell you that every single one of the societies I have touched with mine own hand have turned into better societies for it, and your parties would not be the way they are without me. <laughs> so, you know, Ward McAllister and Mrs. Astor really were the leaders of the cool kids in the Gilded Age. Though all that influence, power, and prestige he worked so hard to obtain would crumble following a single act of arrogance. Ah! That's all it takes. No! <laughs> no way! You see, a friend to all is a friend to none, as these upper crusties would soon <laughs> find out. <laughs> upper crusties! Yes, like upper crustables. Or like uncrustables, but, you know, filled with gold paint and the tears of the working class. <laughs> He seemed to be a pompous and tedious kind of person, and he was already kind of getting under people's skin. But the catalyst for his demise was the publication of his memoir in 1890. Now, I don't understand this at all. My memoir was nothing but an accounting of my experience and, and said nothing uh, uh, spurious or, or, or otherwise uncomfortable about any of my friends. <laughs> okay. Titled Society As I Found It, Ward talks about his life fighting for acceptance by those he saw as his betters and how he was able to infiltrate their inner circle. Also how he got the power to exclude those who shared his social climbing ambitions. My favorite thing is to not share with people how I've done what I've done and to prevent them from doing what I did. <laughs> he then went on to boast about all the glittering invitations he received and the charming parties he attended. He also included poetry that he claimed to have received anonymously. <laughs> like. This is a poetry reading by Justin Palmer as Ward McAllister in a poor impersonation <laughs> of a Benoit Blanc accent. There never was seen so fair a sight as Delmonico's last night when feathers, flowers, Gems and lace adorned each lovely form and face. A garden of all thorns bereft the outside world behind them left. They sat in order as if Burke had sent a message by his clerk. And by whose magic wand is this? All conjured up the height of bliss. Tis he who now before you looms, the autocrat of drawing rooms. So that's totally, you know, something someone would just write to him, right? Not something he would write about himself. No, no. I mean, to think that yeah, to think that someone like Ward McAllister would do that, would claim that someone had written that about him when he had in fact written it about himself, is just ridiculous. It's like, <laughs> it's like signing your own yearbook. <laughs> he also committed the mortal sin of spilling all that tea of his posh friends. A mistake, Which to be sure. Which is something you never do. Yeah, you don't do that. You never do that. Listen, Barbara, I'll never tell anybody about your mistakes. <laughs> he talked about the time a duke chased a turkey, uh, when Miss Saster's carriage got stuck in a riverbed. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the time swans at an elaborately decorated party started fighting each other during dinner. Ah, oh, that would have been great. Great dinner entertainment. Swans are just pretty geese anyway, and geese are aggressive. Nothing you can do about that. Yeah, they're a mean bastard. Then, the most egregious bit. Aside from the blatant and overt racism, <laughs> which really were the most egregious bit. He talked about his friend's ostentatious buying habits and what they spent on their lavish lifestyles. <gasps> you never talk about the money. A guest! I can't believe this! <laughs> he spilled the beans. That the Swan Party costed the modern equivalent of two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. That's too much money. That's so many dollars. Too many dollars. <laughs> he outed his pals for spending nearly six thousand dollars on dinner parties. Too much money. Don't do too it. Too much money. Yeah. He also revealed that one picnic he was commissioned to organize had a twenty thousand dollar price tag. Uh, yeah. That's just you can't. I don't know. So many dollars. Mm-hmm. Too many dollars. And all this lavish spending, while his friends were also getting like $200,000 plus in tax returns. 
this is where I'm putting my foot down. Okay, <laughs> stop it. It's too much. And nobody likes hearing about that. And nobody likes having it said about them. That's the big thing, Good. right? Poor, poor Ward. He was kicked out of the patriarchs with one patriarch, Stuyvesant Fish, telling the press, Mr. McAllister is a discharged servant. That is all. You cannot kick me out of my own society. I created this society. And how dare you call me a servant? I am the society. Yeah, he, he, I am. <laughs> I don't know what just happened just then. I am the society. Not only was he mocked in the press, but so were the people he talked about. <sighs> Town Topics magazine called him Mick Hustler. That's such a good nickname. It's He's his own McDonald's burger. Mick Hustler sounds like an artist's name. The New York Times said on October 19th, 1890. No suspicion that he is making a continental laughingstock of himself must disturb his mind. It would be fatal to him. In this volume, there is no trace of any such suspicion. His hubris and attempt at self-aggrandizing ruined his relationships. It tarnished his reputation, and it revoked the precious access to the elite. And it made him look pathetic. I contend that I have never looked pathetic, <laughs> save the time when I wore an entire outfit made of cheese and beef. <laughs> and sadly, he passed away alone just five years later. And Mrs. Astor skipped his funeral, finding it unnecessary to cancel her dinner party. See, I, I can't help but feel some empathy for him, you know? Yeah. Like, he was, I don't know, he, he was friends with all these people. They didn't actually care about him. They liked what he could do for them. And yeah. obviously it's not good to, like, spill the tea about your friends in a book that you publish. But Yeah, what Stuyves and Fish said was apropos. He really was a servant. He, he had money, but just like Henry Lair, it wasn't nearly a, the amount of his elite friends. Right, yeah. He was always, always on the outside, and he was always used for what they could do for him. Hey, you know, I... Hold on. Do you hear that? Yeah, I do. What is that? Oh my god. It's another telegram from the 1800s. The old town of Flatbush, now the 29th ward of Brooklyn, has a ghost. A Simon Pure, sure enough ghost, that nightly walks on East Broadway near Nordstrand Avenue and stops at the house of Charles Norton to make inquiries for a hand that it lost there many years ago while its restless spirit was in the flesh. These visits are not fully appreciated by Norton or his wife, but it appears that Norton is to blame for the appearance of this ghost, because his ghost ship was not heard of until Norton, while searching for gold in his cellar, dug up a hand that had laid undisturbed for years. There was a ring on one of the fingers of the exhumed hand, and when this had been rubbed, the ghost, in true Arabian Nights fashion, appeared. And as it failed to get instructions from Norton, it is now said that all at once is the hand and the ring, and that thereafter it will cease worrying the descendants of the early Dutch in Flatbush. The story that the old Dutchmen in town tell of the ghost is that sixty years ago, a belated traveller, with lots of gold in his belt, stayed overnight at the farmhouse of one Krug a thrifty Dutch farmer. Krug, when he heard of the large amount of gold that his visitor had about him, gave up his own room to the stranger and insisted that he should occupy it. The next day, the visitor had disappeared, and when the family asked Krug about it, he said the man had departed before daybreak. The bedclothing was also missing, and Krug accounted for this by saying he had burned it, because the stranger had just recovered from an attack of yellow fever. Subsequently, a man's hand was found behind the bed. It had been cut off by Krug with an axe. It is said, when the hand was found, Krug disappeared, and the hand was buried. Mrs. Norton, in speaking of this ghost and its uncanny visits, said the house was haunted, and continued, Everybody who has lived here since murder was done under this roof has had bad luck. One man who occupied the house about forty years ago left his wife and children, and ran away with another man's wife. Another was a burglar. And when he was caught, a whole lot of silverware was found buried in the cellar. Another committed suicide. We've been here for six years now, and there has been nothing but sickness in our family. I don't like to talk about these things. It sends a chill down my back. 
Norton, while hunting for the silverware, supposed to be buried in his cellar, dug up two rusty revolutionary swords and several pieces of an ancient coin before the hand was unearthed. I mean, uh, is it a bad thing to burn your sheets after your guests leave and you bury their hands? Because I, <laughs> I gotta tell you, I do that every time. Yeah, definitely not. I mean, you gotta burn the sheets. Um, it, it might even be good to burn the mattresses that they are on. I will say this for Krug. Do a better job. Why is the hand behind the bed? I mean, people shouldn't be finding this hand. Make the hand happy. Give it manicures. Yeah. Well, okay, so there's the first thing. Don't leave the hand behind. But if you're going to leave the hand behind, you got to know a ghost is coming, number one. And number two, you got to be prepared for that ghost's coming. Give it a sugar scrub. Right. Sugar scrubs. Manicures. Uh, lotions. A hand mask. Right. And then put it in a jar. And display it nicely on your mantelpiece, and guess what? If I'm a ghost, and happy I'm... Happy hand, happy life. Right. Uh, if I'm a ghost, and I'm walking up, and I see my hand all well taken care of on your mantelpiece, I'm not going to bother you anymore. I'm going to be like, okay, I can, I can leave it. We're good. <laughs> and that's it, folks. Thanks for hanging out with us. As always, it has been a blast. Oh my god, thanks for being here. <laughs> Make sure to follow and subscribe so we can find our way into more ears and build our community. Do please, next time you come, bring a friend's ears with you. Whether <laughs> attached or not, we do not care, but we are trying to make this party as big as we possibly can. Find us on Instagram and Facebook at Gilded Goss Podcast, where we'll post pics from today's episode. And we love hearing from you, so if you have any comments, corrections, ideas for episodes, hit us up at GildedGoss at gmail.com. Get at us. And until next time, farewell, cabbages. It's time to face the corn.